Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, part two of this webinar series on, um, you know, what industrial grade wireless networks are and why it is important to understand the distinction uh, uh, between wireless uh, networks that are commercial or carrier grade versus uh, those that are industrial grade um, and why these are needed. So uh, the, if you remember and if you attended the session we had um, two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, uh, part one covered um, sort of the background um, of why we need to understand the difference between um, a, you know the wireless networks for uh, commercial and career grade um, uh, environments versus uh, you know uh, those of industrial environments. Uh, this session uh, we're going to talk about uh, what. Uh, makes a wireless network industrial grade. Uh, the characteristics um, uh, of the equipment that we deploy, the solutions that we deploy in, in industrial environments, uh, which make these uh, uh, wireless solutions industrial grade. Um, so today's um, agenda, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick intro to Redline who we are, uh, and this is an educational uh, webinar, so I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on that. Um, uh, you know, I'll get straight into uh, the topic of the day. Um, I'll do a quick recap, although, of uh, the previous session that we did um, on uh, why should we even consider industrial grade uh, and why it's important to understand the distinction um, and then what industrial grade is and the four key criteria we at redline here use to sort of differentiate or understand um, uh, what defines an industrial grade wireless network uh, so a quick intro, um, Redline, um, you know, we're a Canadian manufacturer of industrial grade private wireless networks. This includes fixed uh, wireless networks as well as uh, uh, mobility. Uh, we've been around for more than two decades now. Um, we are a small organization, but we have a global footprint uh, present in uh, 14 countries. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we've, we've had projects in um, 70 and right now it's more than 70 and 70 plus countries across the globe uh, servicing um, uh, the uh, industrial customers, mainly critical industries, uh, which is um, um, your utilities, electricity, water utilities, um, oil and gas uh, sector, mining sector, public safety, uh, transportation, um, uh, the critical industry. These are the crit critical industries we serve, um, you know, uh, we provide wireless solutions to government sector as well, um, whether it's for um, uh, video surveillance or, um, you know, in some cases, smart, smart city uh, projects, um, uh, rural broadband, uh, military, um, you know, those are the industries that we um, uh, serve, the markets that we serve. And then we also work with telecom sector as well um, when uh, uh, their needs fit um, um, or their requirements um, can be uh, best fit by uh, our wireless solutions. Uh, we are a publicly traded company um, uh, listed on Toronto, Toronto Stock Exchange and we are a very the reason why we've survived for more than two decades under the same name uh, you know a key reason is we are very focused on our own internal r d um, so we have a significant number of uh, patents which you know for an organization of our size is is um, you know not that common um, from uh, uh, you know the market segments that we go after or our differentiation in the market uh, you know as you can guess from the title of this webinar um, the key differentiator is uh, industrial and, and even military grade uh, wireless uh, equipment that we provide uh, that is our bread and butter that is how we differentiate um, um, you know, wireless equipment for uh, the harshest environment on the planet, uh, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a hot desert, a hot, dry desert in, you know, in, in the Middle East or uh, um, close to the North Pole, 
uh, here in North America or, or, or a rainforest in, in Latin America, um, regardless of what the environment is, how dry, how humid, um, how hot, how cold, uh, you know, these extreme uh, environments uh, are equipment uh, is purpose built for these kinds of environment and to s service the um, critical applications that need connectivity in these environments. Um, you know, just sort of what it leads to, what that that um, strategy leads to is basically um, in today's context, um, uh, enabling Industry 4.0 via wireless technology. Um, you know, it's, it's enabling the transformation of critical infrastructure across the globe, uh, whether it's the oil and gas sector, the mining sector, um, electricity uh, grid, um, um, public safety, uh, uh, you, you name it, any critical industry, um, you know, um, harsh environments, uh, we are there. Um, and, and we are there basically to enable AI and machine learning based applications, uh, you know, um, generating that big data via wireless connectivity. So uh, today's topic, um, you know, I'll begin with the context that, you know, sort of I, I, I briefly went through in the previous session as well as well, you know, uh, just so we rem remember what Industry 4.0 is or in North America as, you know, usually referred to as digital transformation as well, uh, you know, which is integrating uh, industrial systems with modern information and communication technologies. Um, what it means is, um, you know, uh, that the industrial systems, when we integrate them um, with modern ICT, um, uh, you know, that is generating this new uh, uh, shift in the market and accelerating the um, uh, innovation um, and um, uh, sort of productivity improvements uh, that have not been experienced in the past. Um, you know, this uh, is driven by uh, specifically, you know, um, machine learning um, uh, and AI um, algorithms, um, which of course, um, you know, take that big data that is generated by sensors across um, uh, the industrial systems, um, and, and then using that data, that data is used by these algorithms to um, make decisions in real time. Uh, with minimal human intervention. Uh, but for all of that to happen, uh, you know, uh, it, it only works if you have that wireless connectivity in there uh, to, um, you know, enable all that, uh, all those sensors and collect data in real time from all these sensors um, in every single component of a complex industrial system. Uh, the connectivity, of course, can be wireline in some cases, but as we know, um, you know, in, in the industrial environments, uh, highly dynamic and complex environments, um, uh, you know, uh, of all the changes uh, that happen on a regular basis, uh, for example, you know, um, the, the changes that a mine goes through throughout its life cycle, uh, that make it, that makes it extremely cost prohibitive to sort of um, provide that connectivity via a wireline system like an optical fiber network. Um, so wireless connectivity today has become essential and mandatory um, uh, to enable that industry 4.0. So now, if that is the case, um, you know, if we need wireless connectivity to transform the industrial infrastructure across the globe, across all these critical in industries which form the backbone of any economy anywhere in the world, um, then why can't we just take, uh, you know, the wireless uh, systems, um, you know, traditionally available in, in the market and deploy it in these industrial environments? Um, can we not you know, simply take a carrier grade um, uh, uh, wireless network and deploy it in a mine um, or, you know, something like the Wi-Fi router in my home that I'm using right now to deliver this webinar. Can I not use that Wi-Fi router um, in an electricity substation uh, or in an oil rig uh, to provide that connectivity? Um, you know, the answer, as those of us who have worked in these industries, um, you know, the, uh, the answer we know is that 
No, the answer is no. Uh, simply um, that it's it's not possible. If we take that route, we'd be forced to one replace the equipment every few months, um, and two, which is something we'll slowly uh, uh, discuss in the next slides, um, is is the dependence in these environments um, on uh, uh, connectivity, wireless connectivity. Is extremely critical from a safety uh, perspective, safety of capital intensive assets as well as um, safety of the human workforce. Uh, so, um, you know, we looked at how, how we understand the difference. We looked at the industrial triangle of distinction um, in the previous session. Um, uh, which was basically the three uh, key pillars to uh, we used to understand the difference. Uh, you know, number one was the reason of existence of wireless networks in, in, um, in industrial infrastructure. That reason is completely uh, different. Uh, in case of the um, career or you know an IT enterprise, uh, the wireless networks are um, uh, there. For a career grade um, uh, network, uh, the network exists to generate revenue. Um, in case of an industrial environment, the network exists uh, to keep people safe, for example, and to provide a reliable connectivity to industrial operation um, uh, operation systems. Um, and that basically, um, uh, you know, means that it's a cost driver, uh, and that has implications. Um, you know, th the fact that uh, an enterprise IT network only cares for IT um, uh, systems, but an industrial wireless network is supposed to cater to the needs of both IT and OT. So that means the functions that are performed are extremely broad and versatile. Um, and, and the environments, uh, we discussed this in detail last time around, uh, that the environments are completely different uh, not that one is more complex than the other um, you know urban environments are um, uh, challenging as well um, uh, but the challenges these environments pose are completely different than the challenges that a high voltage substation or an offshore oil rig or an underground or open pit mine is going to um, uh, 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 that you're going to face when you're deploying these networks So, uh, you know, looking at these key factors um, um, and uh, which help us uh, understand the distinction between these two environments um, and the need for wireless networks uh, in these two environments, uh, you know, that basically, um, you know, um, uh, 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 helps us understand uh, uh, the the how do we define industrial grade wireless networks or the wireless networks that are purpose built uh, to provide uh, the, the functionality that industrial systems need in harsh industrial environments um, and you know high level and I'm going to go through the details of each of these in the following slides but high level four key criteria and very simple to remember industrial grade wireless networks are safe and safety enhancing um, uh, safe meaning they don't introduce any new risk into the environment and safety enhancing meaning a lot of um, uh, safety applications uh, that um, uh, demand you know ultra low latency type of communication uh, you know those applications are enabled uh, uh, by these industrial grade wireless networks and, uh, which enhances safety in that environment uh, industrial grade means uh, reliable wireless networks um, it means secure wireless networks and it means cost effective wireless networks So the very first uh, sort of criteria uh, to evaluate, um, uh, you know, how industrial a wireless network or a wireless solution is, uh, you know, is to look at it uh, from a safety perspective, um, you know, and, and that safety, um, you know, as we discussed previously, um, wireless networks, a key reason these networks exist in these harsh industrial environments 
is to provide safety, which means the safety becomes a system design characteristic uh, for industrial grade wireless networks. When you're designing uh, the system, you're not just looking at uh, uh, what's the capacity requirement and what's the coverage requirement. You're also looking at what are the safety requirements? What are the safety applications? What are the safety risks in this environment? You know, are there explosion risks uh, here? You know, we discussed last time around, I believe, and you can find it in the white paper that um, Redline published earlier this year. Uh, you know, research done by um, uh, Professor Weber, uh, you know, more than 130 years ago. Um, uh, uh, which uh, demonstrated that even wheat dust um, in, in an industrial environment uh, you know can lead to explosion is an explosion hazard uh, in the presence of a source of ignition uh, so when you're designing these networks um, for industrial systems uh, you have to uh, take that environment into account um, uh, so it it must be a system design characteristics um, it, it, we have to keep in mind uh, that um, you know a lot of these safety applications uh, for example um, uh, you know uh, uh, falling conductor uh, protection um, or even air quality monitoring system they are highly sensitive uh, to delays introduced by communication links uh, so, um, um, you know, ultra low latency becomes important uh, for these kinds of networks. Um, the environment, as we discussed, um, you know, uh, it, it is a harsh environment. So industrial grade means intrinsically safe certified devices and networks, uh, which are designed, built and operated by engineers for whom safety is also a culture characteristics. And this is important to understand because, uh, you know, a, an individual, not that, you know, there's a lack of comp competence or anything, but an individual uh, uh, sort of an IT architect who has never worked uh, in a mine, never been to a mine um, and, you know, has a traditionally, uh, traditionally uh, uh, sort of design networks for um, you know traditional IT environments um, will uh, seldom uh, you know or not seldom but at least would be prone to uh, sort of a ignoring that safety as a culture aspect of building these um, uh, networks uh, when you talk to your users in these environments um, uh, you know all they care about is that the air quality monitoring system um, in in that confined space uh, is working 24 7 365 days a year uh, that push to talk um, you know the operational voice uh, that is working regardless of how harsh the environment is and regardless of what kind of disaster is happening out there um, you know that um, um, uh, those applications must be working all the time. Um, you know, that's what they talk about. That concern uh, needs to be understood, which is where that culture characteristic comes into play. Um, uh, so these factors uh, need to be taken into account when we're designing these wireless networks. Uh, the next, next one, reliability. So, you know, again, last time in part one, uh, we uh, discussed the need, uh, um, uh, you know, how reliability need in industrial system is, is different. Um, uh, that, you know, uh, the, the communication networks developed to uh, enable IT application and to service I, uh, enterprise IT, um, you know, they're supposed to be reliable as well. Um, uh, but an underlying difference that we need to understand is in case of IT, traditionally, you're looking at management of information. In case of OT, the operations technology, the industrial control systems, you're looking at managing physical processes, uh, processes that humans at capital intensive assets depend on. Um, so uh, the impact of any, any uh, sort of compromise on reliability uh, for the sake of cost, for example, for the sake of saving a few dollars, you know, that impact is significant. Um, um, you know, I've, I've in, in my 
you know, more than 25 years career in these industries, I've um, uh, seen, um, you know, um, uh, CIOs and, and sort of uh, VPs um, uh, lose their jobs um, because of uh, safety um, incidents um, uh, that happened um, or because of, you know, the, the uh, um, uh, compromised reliability of the underlying networks. Uh, so we need to understand that you know those those reliability needs must be met um, and and what do i mean by that you know the, is it if if someone says well my network or my device uh, it provides you with 49 or 59 availability um, does that mean you know it it meets my reliability requirements uh, unfortunately not um, you know, uh, it, it, we need to take a more comprehensive approach to the reliability needs. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So the very first, you know, durability alignment. And on the next slide, we will discuss why this is important. But durability alignment, the, the uh, reliability of the networks should be aligned with the life cycle of the OT. You want the network to be um, as reliable as it was on day one throughout the life cycle of that um, uh, OT system. So uh, it must be that alignment has to be there. Uh, we need to understand the environmental impact on reliability. Usually in this industry, how, um, you know, uh, historically um, uh, telecom folks and I come from a telecom background um, but have been educated then by these industries uh, is is you know initially you just look at the MTBF and if the data sheet says well MTBF of 40 years um, you know and you know that your mine average life is like 15 years so yeah this is good enough um, but you know the sort of reliability assessment needs to go beyond that um, it needs to take that environmental impact uh, and the complexity of that whole environment into uh, into account so what do i mean about uh, with that just to give you some some quick background you know and don't be scared with the equation I apologize for that it's uh, you know it's it's uh, simple equation and I'll explain it in a bit. What it basically means is that reliability is a function of time. Uh, you know, a reliability as a function of time equals, uh, you know, sort of exponentiating um, the uh, age uh, divided by the, the, the age of the equipment, how old it is, uh, divided by the mean time between failure um, or overall the failure rate, uh, you know, which is lambda. Um, if you look at the graph, which is called the bathtub curve uh, of failure, uh, you know, that's a very standard graph, um, uh, you know, out there for sort of a physical system. Um, initially, um, a, a, at an early stages of a system's uh, life cycle, uh, you know, what is called the infant mortality rate uh, is high at system birth. And it's high at system death when the system approaches near its end of life. Um, it's, it remains pretty constant usually in that middle period, which is what is used to, to derive that MTBF figure um, that you see on a data sheet. Uh, now, the one thing that is uh, seldom mentioned on any data sheet, um, at least I haven't seen any, is that this MTBF number is derived based on a number of assumptions. And, and, and a key assumption is that the system will be operated in an ideal state, in a state that the system is designed for. Now, this has major implications uh, when you take a sort of commercial uh, or career grade equipment and you deploy it into mm, uh, you know a harsh environment that basically demands an industrial grade uh, equipment and 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 this equation on the top helps us understand that so if you know what this equation means basically if you uh, you know put t which is the age of the equipment equal to the mtbf uh, okay, so if the data sheet says the MTBF is 35 years, that means that after 35 years, at time, uh, you know, T equals to 35, the reliability of the equipment is going to be 36.7%. Now, remember, that reliability has dropped over a number of years 
to that state. Now, if someone says, yeah, 35 years, it's going to be 36.7%, uh, and my mind is going to be there for 15 to 20 years, so that's no big deal, it's fine. Um, uh, sure, although it can still be a big deal because you need to look at that curve, how the reliability drops over those number of years, so maybe at year 10, the reliability is no longer 99.9 .9, which is what you expect it to be um, but still let's say we accept that now what happens when you put that equipment into environment uh, that it is not designed for now what is going to happen is this curve will shrink which means that the birth rate the the, the failure rate uh, at birth um, and the failure rate at, uh, 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 at, um, at death, uh, you know, that will increase and, and the time between these two is going to shrink significantly. Because now what is happening is that you've taken an equipment, um, um, again, something I've experienced uh, myself and you would know a lot of times we'll take equipment, uh, sort of regular equipment and put it in, in sort of high salty environment offshore or uh, in a coastal area and in six months to a year you see the kind of corrosion that happens and it destroys the equipment and now suddenly you have um, a, you know significantly high failure rate electronic failure rate in that kind of an equipment so in reality what ha has happened to that failure rate or sort of the mean time between failure rate while the data sheet said 35 years um, in reality uh, it has shrunk to say five years, three years, five years, because it has been installed in an environment for it which it was not designed for, in that ideal environment, which was the original assumption behind this MTBF. Um, and if that happens, now going, if you think about the equation on the previous slide, okay, now suddenly the reliability is going to drop to 36.7% after five years or after three years that is the real reliability then you're getting so when we talk about real reliability we have to take the environmental impact um, uh, on that reliability into account um, the third factor um, you know uh, security cyber security um, you know we know that uh, when you integrate the cyber with the physical when you integrate the modern icts uh, into um, uh, an industrial system okay uh, there are risks uh, uh, that come into play with this kind of integration now the benefits of integration of course outweighs uh, the risks but only if you manage them you cannot avail the benefits of integrating um, uh, industrial systems with ICT systems uh, if you do not manage uh, uh, the cybersecurity risks um, uh, that come with it. So that is a very, you know, sort of important factor we need to understand um, is uh, that when we add connectivity to industrial systems, there are security risks that are introduced into this environment. And if we do not manage these risks, uh, the original benefits that we intended to gain uh, will not be gained. We are putting the system at significant risk. Um, you know, the other thing that we need to understand from a function perspective um, is that security features of the industrial grade wireless networks are prioritized for OT um, uh, as opposed to IT in most cases. Now, I'm, this does not mean that security for IT is no, not important um, and it's only OT. No, both are important. Uh, but what we need to understand is that difference uh, in how we prioritize the security needs in IT, confidentiality, because it deals with information. Confidentiality uh, is, is sort of prime concern that you have. In OT, because you deal with physical processes and the network exists to sort of um, uh, uh, enable those processes, availability of the network takes precedence. And that is an important distinction we need to understand. And that is how we evaluate, we must evaluate the industrial grade wireless solutions that we um, consider for deployment in our industrial environments. Um, 
Of course, uh, from an environment perspective, these wireless networks must follow strict security uh, standards and guidelines, um, you know, which are specific to critical industries. Um, you know, and and you know, this 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 goes back to uh, a sort of common uh, um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Um, uh, and the databases that are uh, available there, you know, modern industrial grade wireless systems should always remain up to date when it comes to uh, protection against common uh, vulnerabilities and that exposure. Um, it, it's, it, it, you know, the in I think it was 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, uh, when that whole event, uh, the Stux, Stuxnet event happened, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a complex, uh, sophisticated malware that was introduced um, into um, a critical industrial system, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of infected the SCADA system um, uh, of that uranium uh, enrichment process uh, in Iran uh, and, and modified the rotational speed of the centrifuges, uh, which led to major uh, system faults, um, uh, random events. Uh, you know, things would change randomly. Uh, you know, that's when uh, the industry suddenly realized, uh, if you remember like, a, a uh, couple of years ago, the British uh, public health system, uh, you know, was hacked into uh, for ransom. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it was last year uh, when an oil field uh, in the Middle East was um, uh, attacked by drones. You know, these are cyber and physical security threats that need to be monitored. Um, and, and these systems must be protected against. And wireless uh, industrial grade wireless systems, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 not only help in managing the risks introduced due to integration of cyber with the physical, uh, but they, um, you know, provide additional protection and can be used for um, uh, video surveillance at remote areas, for example, uh, um, you know, to, to detect any physical attacks. The last but not least, the fourth factor, cost effectiveness. And I'm going to spend a few extra minutes on this because um, cost effectiveness, uh, usually in my experience, um, you know, I've, I've seen, and I've been guilty of it as well in the beginning of my career. Um, you know, I've, I've seen people sort of confuse this concept with lower cost. Um, uh, especially lower initial cost, that is not what cost effectiveness is, is, is about. Uh, cost effectiveness is basically the measure of a system's ability to fulfill its mission considering the total life cycle cost. So it's, it's, a, it's achieving the balance between the system effectiveness which is the system's performance, its reliability, durability, maintainability, the ease of deployment, uh, scalability. It's, it's, it's uh, achieving that system effectiveness uh, in balance with the life cycle cost. And life cycle cost covers not just the initial cost of procurement, but it, it, it covers the operations cost as well. It begins with even the feasibility studies and the investment planning and the proof of concept that you do. And, and it covers all the activities uh, uh, during engineering and construction, and operation and support, and even later on system retirement and phase out. Um, the sort of environmental awareness uh, in recent times across our industries uh, is necessitating that uh, um, uh, uh, the need to look at the cost of uh, retiring a system as well as in, in an as environmentally friendly a manner as possible. Uh, so uh, that is what cost effectiveness is. Cost effectiveness is achieving that balance between system effectiveness and life cycle cost. And so what does that mean for industrial grade wireless network? Um, okay, industrial grade wireless networks, uh, you know, are, are wireless networks which help us maintain that balance. These networks are 
durable, scalable, versatile. Uh, they can be deployed rapidly. Um, you know, they do not consume too much power. They are flexible, can be deployed in cloud or, um, you know, VMware or dedicated hardware, and they are easy to maintain. These are the various factors that we need to take into account. Durability, I already talked about it. So, uh, you know, it's about alignment um, uh, uh, of, of uh, durability of the wireless network with the underlying industrial system. Because if the two are not aligned, what do you think is going to happen to your cost? You will have to replace your wireless network multiple times throughout the life cycle of that OT system. Scalability. Now, usually when, when I use the term scalability, uh, people will think of upward scalability. So the system can go from, uh, you know, so nowadays, let's say a typical carrier grade um, LTE solution starts from 50,000 users. So you, you think of, okay, it can start from 50,000 to uh, 500,000 uh, uh, users uh, or a million users. Uh, yes, that scalability is important, but more important for industrial systems uh, is downward scalability. Can you deploy a network that caters to a few hundred users? We know that, you know, if, if we look at a mine's life cycle, for example, in the beginning, uh, you know, ex at the exploration stage, that mining site, uh, you know, it's uh, very few users. It's a small team. Um, you know, a few GPS antennas, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe one trailer, a team of scientists that will go and um, analyze the soil, uh, conduct the samples and send these samples back. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the kind of environment for, and, and that activity might continue for, for quite some time. It's not like, you know, they'll, they'll go, to a remote location and conduct their testing in, in, in two, three days and that's it, they're done. No, at times it can take years. So the communication system needed at that time, um, you know, you, you don't need a system that supports uh, 50,000 users and you continue paying the licensing fees uh, for 50,000 users when you only have 500 users. When you're conducting a proof of concept uh, trial, you know, just for, uh, you know, in, in one small location for one cell, uh, you don't need a system that starts that high. So downward scalability is as important uh, as upward scalability. Versatility, uh, we talked about this last time as well. Uh, you know, the uh, sort of a, a, a regular um, uh, wireless network uh, um, is is usually there to uh, enable IT applications. Uh, it's all about capacity and coverage. Um, in, in, in industrial grade wireless networks, uh, you know the, these networks are to enable not just IT applications, primarily OT applications. But you know, just because the focus is on OT does not mean that you can ignore IT. You're not going to deploy. Um, is, you know, a separate system for OT and a separate for IT because again, that impacts your cost effectiveness. So you need a system that is versatile enough to, uh, um, you know, provide uh, 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 connectivity for SCADA applications and um, ultra low latency, uh, you know, safety applications as well as the high bandwidth consuming IT applications. Rapid deployment, um, sort of another factor we need to keep in mind. Um, you know, uh, as unfortunate as it is in these industries, um, accidents do happen. You know, fatalities in, in the mining industry, for example, is highest of any other in this industry in the world. So disasters happen. And in, in, in those cases, um, you need, you know, you, you may need sort of a network up and running within minutes in a specific location. The, you know, the networks deployed uh, should be rapidly deployable. I talked about the life cycle of a mine. If, if you look at, you know, the typical life cycle that a mine goes through, whether it's underground or, or um, open pit, 
um, it, it goes from that exploration uh, small remote site uh, you know then to during construction you know um, the, the size of the crew on site significantly increases you start digging tunnels and then those tunnels in an underground mine then keep changing throughout the life cycle so it's a very dynamic environment if the system is, 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 is uh, requires considerable amount of effort to expand and deploy in every new tunnel and as the tunnel changes that is going to add significant cost to your wireless infrastructure so you know uh, today uh, from my perspective uh, um, a private lte network in a mine um, um, or even for for uh, disaster recovery in in other industries like electricity industry it, you know if you have it pre configured tested uh, you should be able to fit it in a pelican case and you should be able to have it up and running within 15 minutes from you know de-energized to energized and operational states in 15 no more than 20 minutes that is what we mean when we say rapid deployment power frugality another thing these are remote sites usually far away from population centers providing power not easy the more power your equipment consumes which by the way in most cases you will need redundant power because you know you want the system to be reliable you know the more power it consumes the higher the cost of maintaining that network and operationalizing that network and power frugality is not just about you know um, uh, an uh, an enode b radio consuming less than 100 watts so that it can power up it can be powered up by a 100 watt solar panel it is also about the type of power the uh, carrier grade equipment 48 volts dc you know enterprise it the router i have at home or in my office you know 110 volts uh, ac or 220 in other parts of the world but that's not the case in a mine or an oil rig or uh, an electricity uh, substation you know you're looking at 30 volts ac you're looking at 12 volt dc 24 volt dc 125 volt dc and if you bring equipment that is 48 that requires 48 volt dc now you have to add rectifiers and, you know sort of voltage converters and things like that so it's it of course that adds more cost flexibility you know it's a, a nowadays it's all about cloud based cloud based sure but you know uh, a, 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 not every um, a industry is, is structured in a way or is regulated in a way where you know cloud-based systems might make sense and, you know it, the system needs to be flexible enough for on-prem deployment and when it comes to on-prem deployment it should be flexible enough that you can deploy it on dedicated hardware as well as in a virtualized environment so flexibility is another key uh, uh, requirement that we need to fulfill when it comes to industrial grade wireless, wireless networks and last but not least maintainability now this is you know one aspect that I've seen so many times uh, um, that it's missed at the planning and design stage uh, of building a network so let's first look at what maintainability is it is the ability of an item to be maintained and it should be a design parameter what is it going to take to maintain a wireless solution in a harsh environment what is the cost going to be that has an impact on the overall life cycle cost remember typical carrier grade equipment is manufactured designed and manufactured with the key assumption that all these major telecom service providers okay have these centralized very elaborate elaborate uh, you know significantly resourced network operations centers um, uh, you know that will manage this network remotely and in addition they would have a significant field workforce uh, that will maintain this infrastructure that is not an assumption 
we can use to build wireless uh, wireless networks for industrial systems because there is no dedicated network operations center there is no highly trained staff that is trained on you know 4g 5g technology um, uh, not just from an engineering design perspective but operations perspective as well So the systems, the the the, uh, uh, the solution that we design, that we develop for these environments, must keep the maintainability uh, uh, um, aspect into mind. They must take it into account uh, uh, when designing these networks. And that need is also driven by, you know, in some cases, the way the industry is structured. These critical industries, a number of them, um, you know, uh, it, it is, as, as I mentioned, remember, it goes back, everything here is connected. So goes back to that distinction between the, uh, you know, career grade environment and industrial grade environment. Uh, you know, it, it, it goes back to industrial grade wireless networks being a cost driver. A cost driver means getting funding for this kind of an infrastructure may not be easy. The way the industries are structured, for example, the North American utility industry, the way it is structured, it, it is much easier to get capital expenditure than it is to get operational expenditure. The whole focus of the industry because of that structure is to minimize operational expenditure. So if we ignore something like maintainability at that design stage, it can lead to what is called the iceberg effect of life cycle cost. In reality, your life cycle cost, the OPEX side, once the system is operational, operationalized, if you haven't taken into maintainability into account and, and uh, sort of aligned uh, uh, the the network design and the network the the product selection with uh, uh, the needs of your operational organization that opex that operational expenditure can actually be three to four times that of the capital expenditure even more companies have reported up to ten times across the life cycle of the uh, equipment they have reported uh, opex. Um, at 10 times that of capex that is what is called the iceberg effect of life cycle cost and that all happens when you do not uh, you know incorporate maintainability as a design parameter uh, when you're building these networks so just a quick case study um, uh, you know uh, 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 a third party consultant hired by um, uh, a government agency uh, to sort of um, uh, test um, radio equipment, wireless equipment from three different vendors in hostile RN, RF environment in a rail yard, basically. Um, uh, you know, I want to share some results here because on paper, the three radios, uh, um, you know, seem very similar from an MTBF perspective, from a latency uh, metrics perspective, from a throughput perspective, uh, you know, uh, uh, all three seem on paper seemed very similar, you know, and uh, I apologize, I cannot share sort of which results are for which vendor, but this is just to demonstrate, uh, you know, how the actual performance in in an in a harsh industrial environment um, can be different uh, when you put um, uh, can be different from the performance on paper, which was evaluated based on an ideal condition. Uh, you know, when you take this equipment and put it into an environment for which it was not designed for, um, it was not purpose built for that environment you will see significant differences. And this is a real world case. Um, you know, the study done a couple of years ago, uh, you know, the client used the same antenna and the same RF cables for all, all radios, the same settings for all radios. And if you look at the throughput results, you can see a clear difference in that environment. How industrial grade a wireless equipment 
is uh, you know it's pretty evident from these results you look at latency again very clear across all three vendors no equipment gave you the same you know all three are different uh, remember the rest of the infrastructure is exactly the same you look at packet loss and this was sort of the most evidence in that you know hostile rf environment the packet loss for two of the three vendors was significantly high and and again on paper it's all the same but if you look at the results in in a hostile rf environment or you 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 do your you conduct your results in a uh, in an underground mine or any harsh environment out there you can see these differences and this happens when you don't take a comprehensive approach to what is meant by industrial grade and and these kind of let's say packet loss for example has significant implications for safety applications for for uh, protection systems that are put in place um, uh, to protect the assets and the people in in that industrial environment So just to summarize, uh, sort of, you know, high level, these were all the factors um, that uh, we here at Redline use uh, to uh, sort of uh, guide our strategy and our uh, uh, build um, of our technologies, wireless technologies, whether it's fixed wireless access or it's it's mobility. Industrial grade for us means safe and safety enhancing. Uh, it's reliability, it's security, it's cost effectiveness. And each of these, it's not just the word cost effectiveness. No, we have defined it and, and you need to define it in your organization as well as to what cost effectiveness means to your organization, what scalability means to your organization, what rapid deployment means to your organization, what kind of risks um, is your organization exposed to, and how can you cost effectively manage those risks. High level, we need to know the difference. Industrial grade wireless networks are low maintenance, longer product life. And they perform the same way no matter how extreme the environment is. Going back to that bathtub curve of failure rate, there is no impact on that curve of the environment. Extended temperature range, extended humidity range, IP 67, 68 uh, uh, rating, has lock for uh, explosion protection, higher reliability, less downtime for these systems, and very low training requirement. They can be easily fixed or replaced by existing IT staff, as opposed to enterprise wireless, um, you know, uh, career grade, let's say 4G networks, um, which require expensive which are expensive to support uh, support and require specialized engineering resources so with that uh, the presentation comes to an end